Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This time I want to talk about a really overhyped buzzword of the current times, which is Industry 4.0. What exactly does Industry 4.0 mean to us? And how exactly did that term come up? So, some explanations, a few examples, and of course the most detailed example, how we exactly want to make it at Tailored Motor. This is episode 14 of Tailored Motor TV. Enjoy! So basically we had four revolutions in the industrial age. The first one was steam power. Mr. James Watt and his fellows made the steam engine and so that helped a lot to move on from water power which was available before. Uh, next one was Electricity came up in the 1900, around 1900, which helped even more to make uh, machines run faster and therefore produce more. Then the next, epi the next revolution came around 1960. It's automation, CNC machines came up, the transistor came up, <coughs> and now the fourth revolution which is bound to the internet. The internet is now over 20 years old and so it's definitely something that's gonna stay and industry has noticed that. And so what is the impact of the internet on the industry? What are the trends going on in the world? We want to be faster. Therefore, we need a better communication because a lot of time is lost in communication. We need to be more flexible, so we have to have smaller batch sizes. We can't just produce a million of everything we make or because we lose flexibility through this. And we need to be more efficient, so we need to reduce the overhead, everything that's around our manufacturing process that makes it slow and heavy. One example is energy monitoring. It was an example I saw from one of the industry leaders. Uh, if you have on each machine in your production line, if you have there uh, an energy monitor, how much it's consuming, you can do a very good analysis. Where is your money going? Because energy is money. You can do load balancing. If you have 10 machines that usually have a big peak power at some point and you have them all running exactly the same moment you produce a big peak in your energy consumption and the peak power is something you have to pay to your energy supplier so if you can delay the start of several of these machines you can reduce the overall peak and pay less again and you can do monitoring in a way to anticipate failure in many ways, the machine, if it's not running properly, it will have some effect on energy consumption. Usually the en energy consumption goes up. So if you see it's creeping up, it's creeping up. Maybe it's a belt drive. Maybe it's uh, some, something that is not as it should be. And you can anticipate the failure, which of course is very good for your production process. Um, you can wrap that, uh, this up as Muda Mura and Muri from the Toyota production system where you have the waste, the overload or the uneven distribution of load, well-known principles in manufacturing. But with Industry 4.0, with the Internet of Things, you have more data to really back this up. Another good example is a connected screwdriver, which has also been launched by a big leader in the industry. Uh, you have an electric screwdriver, of course, and that electric screwdriver uh, gets data from a central server on how much is the tightening torque for each screw you are putting in. So that's very useful because it, it matters. If you over tighten a screw, you can break it. If you don't tighten it enough, uh, it may get loose. So having the right torque uh, is, is important and if you don't need to manually change the torque for the screws you're setting, you, if you make that automatically, you get the safety that it's always right. And a very 
useful second effect on this is that you can count the screws that you're screwing in and if you know your car has 2000 screws and you have only tightened 1900 you know you can't get you can't let that car go off the line because you missed some screws that may be very dangerous so these are very useful examples but i tend to look at the big picture and if you look at the big picture at the vision uh, i would say don't patch redesign from scratch redesign your whole process to adopt these digital technologies of course you can take an existing process add some monitoring on the energy side or add some intelligent screwdrivers but if everything around is a mess it it won't really help you a lot what you really need is a full digital integration from a to z which means from the customer order to the customer service because first the customer orders then you produce then you ship that stuff and once the customer has it maybe he needs some service and if he needs some service usually you, you get back to point one where you have to produce and ship something or, or modify something so that's that's the big picture and it's already widely done in trading now trading companies i mean look at whatever online shops especially in the b2c market um, they really have integrated everything they acquire their customers online they make the whole ordering process online and it's highly automated to the point where the stuff gets taken out of a storage put into a box and shipped to you and if you're unhappy you want to ship it back that's the kind of service they offer which is also integrated in that whole factory now in manufacturing there's there's the big way to go still because in manufacturing you have lots of media breaks where you rely on paper or you you have to transfer the data from one system to the next system which needs some manual interaction and therefore is inefficient but even there in kind of manufacturing there are very good examples one which is a very good example is Vistaprint here in my wallet I have my brand new name cards they got ordered at Vistaprint I had the customer acquisition online of course you see ads everywhere when you're surfing around from Vistaprint and uh, then you design your name card online you upload whatever picture you can add text you have templates after I mean I took about half an hour but usually it's between 15 minutes and half an hour you have your cards set up you have a very good preview and you you set the the little hook that you are okay with that design and they can start printing it for you and they of course feed all that data they have from the online configurator directly down to the manufacturing line there is probably nearly no human interaction needed from the point where they got your order to the point where they ship your order except maybe one guy that adds the paper into the machine and one that closes the box I'm not sure exactly and if you want to reorder it that's the service they offer I think they add a little card in every box of name cards they ship or at least you exactly know you go to Vistaprint you open up your account last order reorder and you do that in one minute you have reordered that stuff compare that to the traditional printing business where you you send some files by email you get feedback is this okay for printing and and so on it's it's way slower if, if you do it the, the old way for the consumer and that's why the consumer in the end is willing to fill up your, your online configurator is willing to do a part of your work because in the end you save him time another great example is Protolabs Protolabs does 3D parts for prototyping I made another video about Protolabs because I'm really amazed about what they, what they are doing so in Protolabs you also have the online customer acquisition you upload a 3D model of a part you want to make they have a 
automated processing of that data to calculate the price. And they do that within hours. I, I got the quotations within four hours after my upload of, of my drawing with, with a detailed 3D feedback. What can they do? What is a bit more tricky? And if you order, then you get your part within days. The longest manufacturing time is three days. So that's really lightning fast. They do that with 3D printing, CNC machining and and injection molding. So they have even very different processes whether for so you can choose what process you want to make it to really have the perfect part. Now, last but not least, our example, how exactly do we want to have an industry 4.0 um, manufacturing for electric motors. Again, we get our customers online. We think it's not useful to have salesmen driving around the country and it's not so to distribute your paper catalog. That's, that's just obsolete. That wastes the time of our customer. Uh, we want to get the customer on an online configuration form where he can set us the parameters he needs, the dimension he needs, speed, torque, length, diameter, what, what exactly the mechanical interface is. And we have algorithms like Protolab had, has to calculate from these parameters what exactly the customer wants. We calculate directly the manufacturing data, the CNC data we send to the machine. We have a CNC machines and laser machines to process the data because that's the most flexible way of producing. Even if laser cutting is much slower than punching, for example, we think flexibility is more important right now. And the laser machine is by dimensions cheaper than a punching machine. So if we want to scale up, we will probably have uh, lots of machines in parallel. They are slow, but since there are many in parallel, we, we still get a rather quick output. And that's also a trend that comes from the IT industry. I mean, if you need a lot of computing power, if you need a lot of storage in the IT industry, what do you make? You make a cluster, you make a RAID. You just take a hundred devices, identic devices, put them in parallel, and here you have your computing power, here you have your storage. And I think uh, in Industry 4.0, that's, that's a very important point because it gives you that flexibility. And free of charge, it gives you the redundancy. So if one or two machines break down, the rest of the machine, the manufacturing line is still up and running. We want after that parts get out of the machines, assemble and ship within days. We also want to have a 24 hour service like Protolabs does. If Protolab can do it, we also can do it. And we want to have a QR code on every single motor we ship to, to enable a fast reordering from the customer. So if the customer has a motor in his hand, he wants a new one, no need to scroll through the emails or look whatever. You just take a picture of that QR code and you directly get to that page where you can reorder it. And that's what I mean by the whole integration. The whole thing is going to work without paper, just data. And that data is integrated in a way that, that you don't need to transfer data from one system to the other. That's the job of the computers. That's what we invented them for. Um, it ends up being a just-in-time production. And I think that's also one important trend of Industry 4.0. As I said before, we have smaller batch sizes. And the smallest batch size is one. And if you go down to a batch size of one without losing too much efficiency, you do just-in-time production, which has the advantage you have absolutely zero storage. You are not producing something on a wild guess what the market could demand. You produce exactly what gets ordered. You have no losses. Uh, if, if I was looking at other motor manufacturers around Germany, there are data available. Some of them have motors in stock for 10 million of euros. 10 million euros of finished product in stock. What do you do if customer 
doesn't want this product. You dump it, you have dumped millions. So that's the big advantage of just-in-time production. And through the full integration of digital technologies, you can reduce your setup time. And that's, that's the, the, killer, the killer value. You have to reduce the key performance indicator if you want to be flexible. Because usually now, traditional manufacturing, you easily have eight hours of setup. If you really want to change your product from one to the next, you have lots of manual interaction. You have a day and after one day everything is set up. You have output a few samples. You say, okay, it's good. We can start the, the big run. And if we completely automate it and also automate the feedback loops, which is the quality control, the checking of the tolerances, and, and invest more in automation, of course, invest more in software to make that happen. If we reduce the setup time to five minutes, I mean, look at the graphics, it's, it's obvious. We, you see that we produce nearly at the same price when we produce one unit compared to 100 units. And if we have a setup time of eight hours, the, the price goes exponentially up for lower quantities, which as I said, then leads to having to put stuff in stock and having overhead over there. What's the conclusion? The conclusion is it is feasible. I mean, we have artificial intelligence. We have image and speech recognition. Uh, we have computational, computational fluid dynamics. And looking at computational fluid dynamics, it's way, way more complicated than doing the simulation of an electric motor. It will take a few years. I mean, for tailored motor, for making one kind of motor in different sizes, I calculate over a year of research and development and setting up the manufacturing line until we can really start shipping. But that's why I want to start now. Because there are people in the field doing it and they're not talking a lot about it, they're just doing it. And if you now spend years evaluating of this, if, if this may be useful or not, you just will get taken over. Thank you for your attention and I hope you enjoyed. See you later with the next video. Bye-bye.